Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Foils, uh, where it says, book lovers, you are among friends as you walk in. Very nice. Um, this Institute of Philosophy, uh, Royal Institute of Philosophy event uh, with Foils is uh, circled around um, a publication which you'll be able to buy if you want to today. Um, this is called the Philosopher's Manifesto. It's a series of, of papers uh, where philosophers give you ideas and arguments about how to change the world. The ideas and arguments about how to change the world today uh, are ideas and arguments about how to deal with the climate crisis or what some people call the climate emergency. The question is whether the fossil fuel industry should, in some conditions, be nationalized. And to talk about this issue, uh, I'm very pleased to introduce Ingrid Robbins from the University of Utrecht, where she uh, leads the Center for uh, Ethics and Organizations, uh, and Fergus Green, who is a lecturer in politics and public policy at UCL, and has written a great deal about climate change uh, and uh, the carbon uh, Carb what, how should I put it? Carbon... The low carbon transition. Low carbon maybe. transition yeah. is the word I was looking for. <laughs> Couldn't find it. Um, and they're going to speak for about half an hour to 45 minutes, and then we're going to have a discussion. You can ask questions. So without any further ado, since we're a bit late already, over to you. Okay, thanks everybody for coming. And uh, I'm really looking forward to debating this uh, question with you whether it's a good idea or not to uh, nationalize the fossil fuel industry. So we, Fergus and I have made a presentation. Roughly, we have four parts. I will first be setting the stage and giving some, some um, background on why we are addressing this question. Uh, Fergus will then make the case for nationalization. I will then zoom in on t three kind of main objections that you can expect from society, and then finally, uh, Fergus will look at the question uh, whether there are limits to this idea. So let me first uh, start with setting the stage. Why have we written this paper about um, nationalizing the fossil fuel industry? We are definitely not the first uh, to, to write about this, but the main people who've written about this are uh, activists. And we thought it was uh, worthwhile from the perspective of uh, philosophy and, and, in, and broader the, the social sciences to really try to go into some more depth about uh, whether this would be um, a, a policy or an institutional change uh, worthwhile. So um, this is uh, the famous stripes from the stripes from the IPCC report. Blue means uh, that there is uh, no increase of the um, surface of the earth. And so what we see is, this is, these are historical estimates, and then it goes up to today. And we can see that in the last decades, where it goes from blue to lighter blue to red, the um, uh, surface temperature on Earth has been going up. Where you see today, this, these are all measurements. And then we have future projections. The bottom one, so there are five. The bottom one is the one where we will stick to the one and a half uh, Celsius, degree Celsius increase. In that case, we should have peak emissions today, and we should halve emissions by uh, 2030. So that's the best scenario that we can get. Uh, and by 2050 or, or slightly later, we would have zero net emissions. So that means we should have no more any emissions from fossil fuels and, and other types of greenhouse gas emissions, or they should be uh, yeah, this uh, det detracted from the atmosphere and the sphinx sinks if such a thing is possible because many of these technologies are still under development or are not yet scalable. But the main point about this graph is there are five different scenarios. The bottom one is the best. It doesn't seem really that we are on track to doing that, but I mean, you no never know whether the governments will and, and the industry will get their act together. All of these, in all of these scenarios, we're going to have further increase of temperature. But if the, if the total emissions um, accumulate more and more, then you see the more you go to uh, the higher uh, scenarios, the average temperature increase will be higher and higher, up to a level that some um, people describe as just uninhabitable. And, um, so this just shows that both it's, there is some unavoidability but also that it's really important to get those emissions down 
as drastically and as quickly as possible. Now, one may then think, okay, if we have to have those emissions down as, as quickly and drastically as possible, um, we may do that in many different ways. And of course, the government often appeals to have, we have a lot of organizations that say, stop eating meat, um, try to um, put solar panels on your um, uh, house, etc. So all these consumer-based options. The problem, however, is what uh, scholars call carbon lock-in. The problem is a systemic problem. It's not just about let's have these emissions and uh, we pledge to have certain emissions and we will take actions to do it. The problem is systemic. The whole system, the way we've set up the economies are such that it is very difficult to um, deal with this in a kind of a marginal fashion. You have to really rebuild and rethink and then um, implement a systematic change. So the actions that need to be taken need to be structural. And what's also important is we should not we should address the supply side. And the supply side means the producers, and that's why we focus on the fossil fuel. And there is support for this uh, view in the, in the academic literature. In the end, you will need a portfolio of measures. So you need um, change in consumption behave, behavior, you need change in technologies, uh, you need, but we, you also need a change in supply uh, side uh, uh, choices and, and um, and the way you uh, organize this. In that view, that there should be a portfolio of measures, we want to investigate the question, what should happen with the fossil fuel industry? And uh, I'll hand over to Fergus, who will make the case for uh, nationalizing the fossil fuel industry. Great, thanks, thanks Ingrid, and thanks everyone for coming. So I'm going to be putting forward uh, a somewhat idealized positive case for nationalization in this part of the talk and then critiquing it a little bit later um, in section four. So um, it's important to note that we assume some pretty significant conditions. And the two conditions we assume are that the government will be suitably motivated and will have effective control over any companies that they acquire. What do I mean by that? So, so we mean, first of all, uh, regarding suitable motivation, we assume that the government will be motivated to uh, achieve decarbonisation, sort of deep and rapid decarbonisation, um, and we assume that they'll be willing to do so using a portfolio of measures that includes uh, taking private fossil fuel companies into public ownership and winding them down in the public interest. And second, we assume that um, the government uh, acquires fossil fuel companies and then uh, obtains effective control over them. Um, uh, we, we assume that it'll, it will do that by uh, taking a majority shareholding in these companies, though there are other ways of, of, of doing it. Um, and what we mean by effective control is that the government will uh, obtain um, uh, the ability to amend the company's charter uh, and, it's, and create uh, public purpose objectives for the company, and also that it will control the majority of the board and on that basis that it will be able to uh, determine the company's strategy and policies and to uh, have control over hiring and firing of senior management. And, and, and we assume not only that these conditions are in place at the time of acquisition, but that they're sustained for long enough to carry out a number of public interest actions that I'll explain in a minute. So these are pretty big assumptions, but I think it's important to note that most policy discussions of climate change uh, in the expert sort of academic literature and policy literature, which is dominated by economists, most of these discussions assume something similar. So you've probably heard economists say that we need a global carbon tax or a global carbon emissions trading scheme. Well, those kinds of claims also assume that the governments are sufficiently motivated and that they have the administrative capacity to achieve that. Now, we certainly think that one should scrutinise those assumptions, um, and we're going to do that, as I say, later, later in the paper. But what we want to do is sort of, with these somewhat idealised assumptions, present the best possible case um, for, for fossil fuel nationalisation, and then critique the assumptions later. I'll just say one more thing before going into the case, and that is that there are some other complexities that we sort of abstract from. So, um, we don't focus in the paper on how the government acquires these companies, exactly which ones it should acquire. 
But I think for the sake of the argument, just make a stylized assumption that we're dealing with one country um, and assume that the country, say, has one fossil fuel producer and that it produces fossil fuels only within that country. And we're going to consider the case for the government acquiring that company. And then we can bring in some of the complexity later on uh, when we discuss some, some of these, these constraints. Okay, so with, all, with these various assumptions um, and abstractions, let's now go to the positive case for fossil fuel nationalization under those conditions. So the way we do this is we list 10 public interest actions that governments could take if they had acquired these fossil fuel companies. And we evaluate them on the basis of a primary criterion of social justice. And we mean by this something like that all persons, current and future, uh, have genuine opportunities to achieve well-being, defined as the most central human functionings. And so for the purposes of this talk, you can sort of roughly break that down as ensuring the ecological conditions for justice for all people in the future, so the sort of climate justice aspect, and then also ensuring justice in the transition, so ensuring that people are not too adversely affected by decarbonisation policies. And so what I'm going to do now is go through these 10 public interest actions in groups of three and talk about how they contribute to social justice. And then I'm going to say a little bit about our secondary evaluative criteria, which are fairness and democracy. Okay, so the first three actions are all about um, sort of the most obvious thing that would come to mind, which is that the government gains control over the fossil fuel production and the fossil fuels themselves. So um, the, the, the government would then be able to, through these companies, cease exploration and development of new fossil fuel deposits, which is still happening at quite a striking rate. Um, and of course, phase out existing production, you know, in line with, say, the Paris Agreement or these sort of broader social justice goals. So not switching it off overnight, but phasing them down um, in sort of a reasonable, um, a reasonable period. Um, and it could also use its existing market power um, to sort of further increase the price of fossil fuels. Now, all of these three things will increase the price of fossil fuels. And I want to just say a few things about that because some alarm bells will probably be, be going off. The first thing to note is that any ambitious climate policy will increase the price of fossil fuels. If, if, if you're in favour of carbon pricing, carbon taxes, carbon emissions trading, the whole point of that is to increase the price of emitting carbon, most of which comes from fossil fuels. So we're hardly out on a limb by saying that climate policy should increase the price of fossil fuels. But two important caveats. We also believe, although it's not core to this particular paper, that governments should also introduce complementary measures um, to ensure that um, vulnerable people in particular, potentially even sort of you know, middle income people, should, um, should not be worse off overall. So that could be involve you know, changes to income tax, to say reductions of income tax at the lower end, um, reduction of other taxes, uh, could be increases in, in benefits and transfer payments, various things that governments can do to ensure that we have this incentive to reduce our energy consumption, fossil energy consumption, but that the burdens are ultimately borne by the wealthiest. So we, we endorse that. And, th and the second caveat is to say that in times like at present, when there is already, for other reasons, very high oil and gas prices, the the government focus should really be on more demand side measures, so the other aspects of the portfolio that Ingrid talked about. There's not that much more you could gain from you know, restricting, further restricting supply at the moment. But I would say that um, you know, the, the industry likes to use uh, high oil prices to say, oh, we need to invest in more exploration and, and development. But that might take you know, at least four years to sort of develop those fields. So that's not going to help re re alleviate price pressures now. So we should definitely still not be you know, locking in further um, fossil fuel use through new exploration and development. But you know, in times of high oil and gas prices, the emphasis should shift toward demand side measures. But on the whole, these are sort of the, the key things that government would gain control over. The, the sort of key ability to reduce emissions would be through sort of controlling and restricting the supply of fossil fuels. Um, there are another cluster of actions that the government could take that in other ways would contribute to reducing uh, emissions or tackling climate change, reducing carbon lock-in. So the first is that um, while the previous three points relate to the emissions from fossil fuels themselves, which are usually combusted by some entity downstream, 
um, could be us when we turn on our cars, if we have cars, um, or, or big companies when they're combusting fossil fuels to produce electricity. But the fossil fuel companies themselves also have emissions in, in their own operations. There's things like um, methane leakage from oil and gas production, uh, from leaky pipes, or gas flaring, or electricity used in the production process. And the government would also gain control over these um, and could reduce those emissions. Um, uh, it could leverage fossil fuel companies' assets in a genuine effort to research, um, uh, for, to, for, for research development and demonstration of new technologies. Um, for example, off, uh, offshore oil and gas companies could use some of that expertise and skills to support offshore wind development, um, is sort of one, one possible example. And then finally, and this is I think a really important point that distinguishes public ownership of the company from mere sort of regulation and pricing of companies, um, which is that you could turn these companies from climate villains to climate champions. So we know, it's well documented, that fossil fuel companies have um, known about climate change in some cases since like um, before the 1950s, that they've been doing research on it, but that they deliberately misled the public over the causes and consequences of climate change. We know they spend millions lobbying governments for um, generous fossil fuel subsidies and against climate regulations, um, that they support candidates uh, and donate to candidates who support those positions. So they're a big reason why we're not acting more generally on climate change. But a suitably motivated government, um, you know, under those conditions I laid out, would, would, could sort of turn them, so, so avoid all of that negative public and government relations and turn them into champions of, of decarbonisation. So these first six actions are all ways in which um, it would, uh, this, this measure um, could contribute to the climate justice as aspect of social justice, right? Reducing emissions at the scale and speed um, required. And then the last four actions on our list of 10 are more about social justice in the transition. And, and so these are things like in, uh, ensuring that they, they pay their taxes, right? Currently we know fossil fuel companies are big tax evaders and avoiders. Um, they have some problematic uh, labour and community relations in a lot of cases, uh, health, safety and environment as well, so we can ensure that they're best practised in, in those areas. Um, there's lots of problems with decommissioning mines and wells, so we can ensure that they adopt best practice standards for decommissioning and restoring sites, and that could actually employ a lot of the workforce. And then finally, and related to that, they could ensure a just transition for the workforce and affected communities. So currently, privately owned fossil fuel companies largely treat their workers as, as factors of production that are dispensable, and so if labour-saving technology comes in, or if the oil price or, or the fossil fuel prices crash, they, they'll be happy to sort of shed, um, shed their employees, or in some cases they're filing for bankruptcy to avoid um, paying their uh, legal entitlements. So the government could be a model employer and ensure that workers are redeployed to different areas, more sustainable areas of the business. Um, they could be retrained to support that employment. They could ensure that they get all their benefits and entitlements and more generally are supported in the transition. Um, so there are our main arguments for sort of the benefits, the social justice benefits that could come from um, ownership of fossil fuel companies. Uh, we, we make a couple of other sort of secondary arguments. And the first is essentially looking at fairness. So beyond ensuring justice, there's a question of how the benefits and burdens of various policies are, are, um, are distributed among the population. And we don't make a substantive argument about the criterion of fairness that should be used. We simply make the point that if the government has control over the companies, then um, it has a greater ability to achieve whatever the relevant sort of fair distribution is. So for example, it could coordinate monetary and fiscal policy along with its um, operational control over the companies to ensure that um, really, for example, say it's the, the wealthiest that, that bear the costs. And we're assuming that these will be kind of loss-making entities, right? Because they're, they're phasing them down, they're avoiding um, sort of financial benefits from, from production. And then we make two arguments, uh, democratic arguments in favour of this policy. So the first is really about control. And, and the idea is that um, currently, if you have economic, if you have companies in, in private hands, then you have basically a bunch of rich people making decisions about potentially important assets. Um, and sort of the more, the more that they're in public hands, the more the public can exert control 
over those, um, uh, over those important decisions. And this is, I think, particularly Im important in the case of fossil fuel companies, given the scale of their, you might call them externalities, or uh, their, their potential to sort of influence important decisions, right? potentially sort of the, the future of, of, uh, of human and, and non-human life on, on the planet. So there's a real case for bringing these key decisions that they, fossil fuel companies make um, and, and giving the public greater control over, uh, how, over how these organizations are run. And then the second argument relates to this point I made about turning them from climate villains into climate champions. So we might think that there's something important about relatively equal opportunity in a democracy to influence public policy and to influence government decision making. And for the reasons I outlined before, we know that fossil fuel companies have really kind of distorted that. Um, uh, the, the public's uh, voice on, on these issues for various reasons to do with their public relations and, and their government, government lobbying and, and, and so on. So by removing that distortive influence, we're arguing, arguably in, increasing the opportunity of ordinary citizens to influence the policy process. So that's our positive case. Um, and now I'll turn to Ingrid, who's going to consider um, three objections. OK. so. Here are three of the main objections that, one, that we expect that people will make against the idea of uh, nationalizing the fossil fuel industry. The first one is um, that people might say, well, but this really is a redundant idea because we have a, a set of other policy options that would be um, much better actually at delivering um, this, this, um, um, the goal of reducing the emissions. Think about things like uh, removing the fossil fuel subsidies, because we know that um, the fossil fuel industry is now heavily subsidized, so that would be one way. Um, perhaps banning the new fossil fuel exploration and development, uh, reducing existing production. So all forms of regulation that would also affect the supply side, hence uh, the, what fossil fuel companies can do. And we think that um, many of these um, are, good are good policies and they may also be necessary in the mix. However, um, that it would be more effective to have um, those policies in combination with nationalized fossil fuel um, industries or hence public ownership. And the reason is for what we can expect to happen after we would have implemented that regulation. So suppose we, we then compare the set of regulations such as um, we um, um, no longer any fossil fuel subsidies or, or uh, carbon pricing, etc. In a situation where you have um, then that in uh, private hands or you have public ownership. And the problem, there are two reasons to believe that it, um, it's better to have this, even if you have this set of regulations, to have it in a case of uh, public ownership. And the first one is that there, there will be a set of um, implementation and enforcement challenges if uh, you were to try to do this under um, private ownership. Because there are information asymmetries between the government and the private sphere, private, private companies, which means that um, they can try to um, game the system, uh, avoid certain regulations, try to um, find ways to avoid the regulation. Whereas, of course, if the company that is, um, have, has to implement these regulations is at the same time uh, owned by the government, you don't have this sort of uh, um, problem that uh, private, uh, privately owned companies who, by definition, are profit-seeking will try to avoid these uh, rules. Um, and actually, this is uh, reasonable to expect that this, would, that this is not just theoretical, but would happen in, in practice. Because as Fergus already said, uh, there's lots of evidence that the fossil fuel industry has actually uh, been very capable at uh, what we call uh, gaming the system, at um, trying to game and capture uh, regulatory and tax uh, systems. So that is one reason why we think a set of other policy um, a set of other policy options would not be as effective in uh, the goal of trying to uh, reduce the uh, total production of oil. And there is an, there, but there is another reason. 
And the other reason has to do with uh, what Fergus already said about the difference between being a climate villain and a climate champion. Um, is that if they would, if the companies would still be privately owned and hence profit seeking, um, they would try to double their their efforts that they now already they already do these efforts now to weaken the legislation or repeal the legislation. So fossil fuel companies, privately owned fossil fuel companies, try a lot to influence the policy making, and one can expect that if, even if these policies would be implemented, that as long as these are private companies, they will try then to weaken or repeal the um, legislation. So we think that post-enactment, post-enactment of this uh, set of policies, it would be uh, more robust if you were to deal with um, common, uh, public ownership rather than private ownership. So that's the first objection. The second objection is one that I think we will uh, hear in, in societies at large, which is that nationalization is always um, less preferable than having uh, production via the markets. And why is this? Well, this, this, the reason behind this um, is, comes from basic economic theory, and that is that uh, if you have perfectly competitive um, markets, which means that the, the companies are in perfect competition with each other, the, the welfare that they generate is uh, larger. Now, before we go and analyze that argument, we should notice uh, that the current fossil fuel market is far from competitive. In fact, it is one of the least competitive markets because they're heavily subsidized. Uh, and also, if they were perfectly competitive, they would, what economists call, internalize in the price the negative externalities. That's a technical word for they would pay for all the climate damage that they do and possibly also say uh, other types of damage uh, in case the exploration of oil fields lead to say uh, social damage or human rights violations and so on. And right now um, that is not happening. So right now we do not even have um, uh, competitive markets in or competitive uh, markets uh, for uh, fossil fuel um, uh, um, sales, but uh, we will grant the, those who would make that objection to us, we will grant them that let's imagine, let's imagine you would have um, a perfectly competitive, competitive uh, market. Would that market be more uh, efficient and also more welfare enhancing? Well, economic theory, sort 101, the most simple form, which is also the one that, that informs uh, the, lots of the public debate, says, yes, if you have perfectly competitive markets, then you have higher aggregate welfare because of the efficiency gains of markets. Um, however, in this type of argument, efficiency is equated with um, aggregate welfare, um, the total welfare that's um, created in, um, in a certain population in, in a country. But this argument assumes, or this ar argument in, the, in theory only works if everybody is, if you basically don't have great inequalities. Because the reason why you can equate efficiency with uh, welfare maximization is because then um, welfare maximization is, is basically to what extent can you fulfill your preferences given the resources that you have. But if you have great inequalities and some people are very rich and others are, are poor, then um, it is not necessarily the case that those who will be willing to pay more have greater uh, preference satisfaction. They just happen to have more money. And uh, hence this theoretical um, assumption really, it's a, it's a theoretical result from economic theory, only holds if you have roughly uh, equality of resources, equality of money in society, and that condition is not met. So, and if you have highly unequal uh, societies, then uh, there are certain scenarios under which um, rationing by the government or other types of distribution are more welfare enhancing. So we conclude that the second scenario actually assumes a certain world that we do not have and also uh, can be answered. And then there is the last scenario, which is uh, 
um, basically borrowing on uh, Friedrich uh, von Hayek's work, that if you uh, restrict economic freedoms, which is what you do if you were to uh, move a private company into public ownership, that first you restrict uh, economic freedoms and the next thing you will do is restrict political freedoms. So we should really be very worried about this kind of argument that Fergus and I are presenting because it's the road to totalitarianism. Now, our answer to this is uh, twofold. On the one hand, uh, co the governments have already lots of ownership. Um, even governments that are uh, doing relatively well or well on democratic criteria have all sorts of ownership. So uh, we don't think that that theoretical worry or that, uh, that Hayek had uh, is, is really grounded in, in reality. And the other one is that we are not arguing for nationalizing all sorts of industries. We think it's important to really reason, like what is the goal you try to achieve? In our case, it is um, winding down the, uh, the, the, those sectors because we need to keep the oil and the coal and the gas in the ground. And that was why I showed you the first graph. That needs to be done fast and efficient. And that's why we think the government, well-meaning and a uh, good government should take control over the, those sectors. Um, but of course, for another type of industry, this may not be what's necessary. So the economic design of the sector should follow the goals that as a society you have with, um, with a certain sector. So for example, consumption of uh, consumer goods, there is no reason for ordinary con consumer goods to nationalize it. But we think in the case of uh, fossil fuel, that there are good positive arguments why this should be considered. And now we come to the fourth and final objection. So the, the final objection, so the, the three objections Ingrid considered are really objections to our conditional positive case. The final, we, we consider it as a final objection in the paper, but it's really a slightly different beast. That's why we're tackling it separately here, because it's, it's more questioning the, how realistic our conditions are, those conditions are of uh, suitable motivation and effective control that I laid out earlier. And saying, okay, so to what extent do those apply? You know, and, and so therefore this gets to the, the part of our talk about the limits of nationalization. So let's go back to these two conditions. So I mentioned the suitable motivation and effective control. And I said that they, we assume that they're in place at the time of the acquisition and also that they're sustained um, for long enough to carry out the public interest actions. That's what I mean by sustainability, just in that sort of literal um, sustain for the, the necessary duration. So let's look at, let's kind of look at these different boxes. So, so when it comes to suitable motivation, we said we need, the government needs to be sort of suitably motivated to tackle climate change. And of course it has to have fossil fuels for our particular proposal to be, to be relevant. So, okay, so which countries have motivated or could conceivably be motivated to really be climate leaders or, or climate champions. Well, you've got the sort of very vulnerable, climate vulnerable states like small island states who tend to be climate leaders, but they don't really have many fossil fuels. So, so you next you might look at the sort of rich democracies which potentially are climate leaders or at least could conceivably be, become so. Um, and, then you, and then you look at those that have significant amount of fossil fuels and actually you're down to quite a small number that, could, that this could really potentially apply to. So um, just to consider this, um, this chart, so this is um, a, a graph showing so-called carbon bombs. Now a carbon bomb is to, to defined as a fossil fuel extraction project that has the potential to emit more than a billion tonnes. And the circles uh, are based, uh, look at the countries and look at the total potential emissions from their big carbon bombs. And it basically, the message is, most of them are in industrializing, middle income um, or lower income countries. There's actually really only a handful of countries that have really, sig uh, of, of rich democracies that have significant um, fossil fuels. And they are basically the United States, Canada, Australia, uh, Norway, and to a lesser extent, the UK, Denmark, and a few others. So, so that's a pretty significant limitation. And then also, um, uh, you know, they have to be motivated to do it at least partly through public ownership. So they're going to have to be somewhat social, socialist in their motivation. And you might think, well, even in the rich democracies, there are not going to be many who, even if they want to be climate leaders, are going to be motivated to, do, to, to take, um, take these companies into public hands. 
And we would say, well, maybe at the moment, but things are changing pretty quickly um, uh, or, or changing to some extent. So in the left of the Democratic Party in the United States and the left of the Labour Party in the UK, for example, there is a, you know, I think a resurgent socialism um, or, you know, which is really sort of geared towards the, a mixed economy and, and including taking fossil fuel companies into public hands. And so it's not implausible that these countries could come to be, to have this um, public ownership uh, motivation. Um, but then there's an additional challenge about sustaining this over time. So if we're limiting it to rich democracies, and the ones that I mentioned are mostly rich democracies with majoritarian electoral systems in which control of government is, is sort of relatively unstable and the parties are relatively polarised, particularly thinking of the US, Canada, Australia and, and the UK, um, then you're going to have uh, shifts in control of government over the duration necessary to phase out fossil fuel. So you could imagine even in our best case scenario from the first box, you might have this, you know, the Ocasio-Cortez government in the United States comes into power and takes uh, uh, US fossil fuel companies into public hands, but then, um, and they have a democratic legislature, but then in a few years, the Republicans get control of government um, and it's drill, baby, drill. So that's, and that's a real, real risk, right? So, um, so we, the this, this sustainability of the relevant motivation. Um, and also in terms of effective control, there are sort of various risks and, 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 and challenges there. Um, Taking the first two, so the government has to have the, the, the fiscal capacity um, and the administrative capacity to undertake these actions. Um, now, we've, we've, as I said earlier, we've bracketed the issue of how the acquisition occurs. We can talk about that in the Q&A, but roughly you could, they could buy the companies on the open market or buy a majority of their shares, they could buy the assets, or they could compulsorily acquire them and pay some degree of compensation, potentially zero. There are some philosophical arguments for that. But, um, you know, either way, they're going to have to have either the economic capacity to pay or the, ec or the, or the economic capacity to with withstand the capital flight if they just acquire them without paying. Um, and they're going to need the administrative capacity to be able to really control, exert operational control over these large companies. And that gets to this last point about pr principal agent problems, which is that even if the government sort of nominally acquires control, these companies are sort of so large and autonomous and have these historic cultures and, um, uh, and the sort of people who work for them, um, that even if you sort of cut off the top management and installed your kind of government people, um, they might not really be able to obtain the necessary control to implement all the actions that we've said. Or even if they do initially, they might be co-opted by middle management and, and sort of the, the initial profit-seeking fossil fuel extractive motivations will come into play and the government wouldn't be able to sustain that control. And basically we think these are all like legitimate risks. They're going to be largely jurisdiction dependent. And so what we really sort of end the paper on is kind of a plea for more detailed research, multidisciplinary work between philosophers, business management experts, political economists, uh, uh, country experts to kind of explore the possibilities of where, this, um, wh where these risks might be smaller and how they can be, how they can be, be managed. Um, so with that, I'll just come to a, some con concluding thoughts and stepping back and thinking, given that this is a Royal Philosophical Society event about the role of philosophers in the climate crisis and sort of how we've tried to kind of model that in this paper um, or exemplify that in, in this paper. So the first point is just to, in, in, by way of conclusion, is just to say that, um, you know, one of the things philosophers can do is um, put bold ideas on the table or apply sort of philosophical tools to existing ideas that are out there in circulation. You might think of um, the work that people have done on, on, uh, on basic income or on open borders. Um, you know, these, these are sort of big ideas that philosophers can, can consider. And that's sort of what we're, we're trying to really do in this paper, uh, along with our, our colleagues, uh, fellow authors of the Philosopher's Manifesto book. There's also, I think, something important here about sort of shifting the paradigm from just thinking about emissions in a relatively decontextualized way, as is often done in climate policy discussion, to thinking about these systems that are currently sort of, Ingrid talked about carbon lock-in. And we think philosophers need to think more along the lines of kind of these systems, thinking about really systemically important actors and therefore why fossil fuel companies are important, not just because they're like any other emitter and they have a, just, a, just a higher number, a higher degree of emissions, but also that they you know, have these roles in the political economy that, are, that I've discussed, right? And so 
So we think that sort of philosophers need to take these kind of systemic roles of these key agents more seriously. Um, and we've also, I think, contributed to a, a resurgence of longer standing debates about sort of capitalism v socialism, mixed economies, the role of ideology and, and ownership in, in sort of in political economy. And we think that you know, climate change in, in general and the need to tackle it is really, I think, pushing a lot of these more general debates, sort of reconsidering sort of the role of the state. Because the state is going to have one way or another um, need to have a crucial role in, in, in tackling climate change. And so, you know, th these sort of questions of ownership um, more broadly become relevant. And so we, we think we've, we're sort of contributing to that, um, that trend. And then the final point, as I said a, minute, a moment ago, is really just a, it's a plea for interdisciplinarity and methodological diversity. Um, and we hope that we've uh, uh, embodied that to some extent um, in this paper. So thank you very much for listening. And we really look forward to your, your questions and the discussion. Thank you, Ingrid and Fergus, for such a clear presentation. Uh, we now have time for questions from the audience. Uh, if you would please put your hand up and just hold it there for a little bit so I can uh, keep track of who wants to ask questions. And once the questions start, um, I will leave it to Ingrid and Fergus to decide who answers <laughs> which, which of them in what order. Uh, so any questions from the audience? OK, so we start here on the third row. Would there be like plans as well for the more kind of distribution side of it as well? So like the companies that move the oil around and then like in turn using that like shipping as well? Or is it kind of more just a basic supply side, like only the producers? Happy to, uh, happy to answer that. Yeah, so, um, so we focus on the, the producers, but we do think that our arguments could be, um, could be applied, similar arguments could be applied um, to other parts of the fossil fuel supply chain and in, indeed other heavily emitting or carbon dependent sectors. So that's probably, a, you know, like Ingrid was saying, we're not saying that the whole economy should be nationalised. We're focusing on fossil fuel supplies, but, but our arguments, I think, probably do apply to, say, electric utilities potentially, and there's been quite a bit of discussion about um, sort of government ownership or, or community ownership of renewable energy. Um, and I think similar arguments could be applied to the sort of midstream, um, uh, you know, say, the, the fossil fuel transportation um, sector as well. So, yeah, we don't consider that in the paper, but I think the arguments could, could be applied to those. Okay, on the first row. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I've got a statement that I need you to probably verify if it's true. Uh, and the statement is, government is the most efficient method of distributing um, what we'd call as common goods, communal goods. And this is how I look at it. When we describe efficiency, we, we, we talk about the least amount of waste and damage. Um, and in the case of for, uh, fossil companies, um, they do not care about the impact. And if it's government, then they will care about the wider impact. And in that sense, it will be the most efficient way. And it's looking at that as how we looked at roads when we removed all the tolls from roads and nationalized roads, and that's why you've got the motorways. Um, so there is always governments in theory and governments in practice, that's one thing. But I do think you're right. And then, of course, one can argue about particular governments. I mean, if you just look at all the governments we have in Europe, it's already, and I include now R Russia in Europe, it's already quite a big difference what kind of governments we have. But um, you are right that um, the, I, you haven't uh, explained or you haven't uh, said how you would understand common good, but I just assume like something more collective values in a sense security things like yes things, things yes energy, okay water, public so public goods is then part of the of the common good but also i assume uh, often under this concept is also the quality of the relationships of citizens is also part of um, public goods uh, of the common good and um what, what i really so i don't um I think the government is not a goal in itself. 
the government is there to serve um, the citizens. And some people, some philosophers would say actually not only the citizens, but also the uh, animals and the plants, so the whole, the earth, or the earth for which they are responsible. And, um, and I think what uh, is important to um, make it, to always make a distinction, which is one of the most basic distinctions in philosophy between means and ends. And the government is a, is a means, a coordination mechanism, and a delivery mechanism for certain ends. And I agree with you that the common good, we cannot leave that to um, profit-seeking entities because by definition they have a different, a different role. But you have of course also um, collectives. So sometimes I can imagine that in reality, uh, and then roads may be a bad example, but that uh, sometimes when you have a badly functioning government, that collectives, groups of people working together, may for some aspects of the common good be more efficient. So I w I'm not prepared to under underwrite the statement that the government is always the most efficient mechanism or, or instrument to the common good, but I'm definitely prepared to, uh, to underwrite the statement that the government is in many cases necessary to protect, protect and advance the uh, co common good. And uh, Fergus at the end said something about the need to, to um, reopen and further develop this discussion about economic systems and how that relates to ideology. And one thing that strikes me is that I was trained as an economist before I then turned to philosophy. So I studied e economics in the uh, first half of the 1990s. I, but of course that was before the fall of the Berlin War. And I was taught you have communist regimes, you have capitalist regimes, and then you have the mixed economy. These days almost, almost nobody talks about the mixed economy. But if you have that model in mind, then the question really becomes, you have private ownership, collective ownership, common ownership. What is the best, best mixture over different types of markets or needs that we want to meet um, in order to have the best society? And the government will play an important role there. And so I think, yes, to the, to the extent that that was what you were after, I agree with you. Uh, I was just throwing the spanner in the box. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've bitten a small bit of your uh, part, but, but I do not think that we can, that for everything, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, it also it really depends. I mean, I think, for example, if you think about Russia today, I hope really there are really strong civil society because you just see that the, the government is not doing anything for the common good. Quite the contrary. It depends on you perceive as common good. Yeah, but that, you didn't define that, so I think we'll leave that uh, here. Okay, next question is from the white column. Back. I mean, thanks for, for this inspiring talk. Um, when I think of nationalization of the fuel industry, I have this image in mind, and that, that makes me uneasy. And the, the, the image is Eastern Europe after 1991. And I just remember this very vividly. I'm sort of just, just, just old enough. It was just a huge mess. It was worse than almost anyone had expected. I mean, you went to a refinery anywhere in Eastern Europe, and it was terrible. And that always makes me think there was something that these clearly nationalized, um, often very large companies, just couldn't do very well. And I suspect what they couldn't do very well is just relatively cleanly produce and refine oil. And that's one thing that, you know, for better or worse, um, private companies um, in that sector seem to be doing quite well. So it worries me a little bit that there might be there might be a specific function of private companies, and that is to build up specialist knowledge that the state often struggles to build up in the same way. Um, I don't think that goes all the way, you know, into the Hayekian argument, the road to serfdom, anything like that. It's a very limited argument that sometimes private companies just do certain things a bit better than the state. That's a good example. Like we need to look at historical examples, um, and um, and I'm I'm sure that's very informative. I mean, just to maybe make a sort of more theoretical point in response. So I suppose there could be sort of different degrees of, um, or, or or the state can do different things once it have has these companies. So um, what we've sort of said is that they would hire and fire um, senior management. They would have control of the board. So presumably a lot of that specialist knowledge would would be retained, right? But then perhaps, so there's, there's probably a tension here, right? Because 
the less that they, the less they change the company, um, uh, the more the specialist uh, knowledge and skills they have, but perhaps the more autonomous the company is, and so the more these principal agent problems become a risk. And the vi vice versa is true. The more they kind of take over the company, the more they can do what they want, but the, the less capable they'll be of doing the things that they need to do, including providing fossil fuels, you know, during the transition period. Um, so I think that's, that's a good sort of theoretical tension to raise. And I don't have the answer to how best to manage that, that tension, but it, as part of this sort of plea for interdisciplinary work, you know, that would include looking at sort of historical case studies of, of nationalisation and, um, uh, and, and what, what worked well and what worked less well and, and how it could, could potentially work. Yeah. Okay, but I want to make two additional points because the first one is um, these uh, companies uh, after, after 1991, they were in a communist regime. So they were in a both um, collective ownership of, of the means of production in general, not just one sector, but all sorts of stuff, and uh, yeah, whatever you want to call it, political dictatorship, or and then it's also limited development of certain scientific knowledge, etc. So I do think um, it would be if you want to, you would, your argument would be stronger if you could find an example of um, a collectively owned fossil fuel industry that was in a, a, an open society. So I just think we cannot draw a conclusion from that society because the whole society was different. So that would be one uh, part of the, uh, my answer. But the other part is, let's also look at the other, the other direction. So not what do we see when we find, when we look at um, 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 industries, in this case of fossil fuel, that, that were uh, in collective hands and the kind of uh, mess they made or how inefficient they were. What, um, what do we see when we, because your argument is about specialized knowledge, but look at examples of where we had um, collective uh, delivery of um, the, common, the, the common goods services that uh, the, 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 you mentioned before about like safety roads, etc. Take trains in Europe. We've had a number of countries where we had collective train uh, provisioning and it moved to the private sector. Has that improved? I think in several cases not even though your argument would be there was specialized knowledge. So I just think you need more to, um, you, you would need more uh, just specialized knowledge. I think there should be more to the case to be worried. Probably mentioned Aramco, the Saudi Arabia state-owned gas company. It, it can produce it very well. So the, the, the is, more to that just being a state. It's more the ideology that runs the state, and it's more that even if, if, if you've got a meritocracy, it's different. If you've got a patronage state, then it fails. So it's, it's more that ideology behind nationalization than nationalization yeah. itself. Just quickly one thought, I don't know enough about this case, but one example of sort of the, an open society case would be the, the Obama administration, which took control of, I think, was it Ford and General Motors, or um, the sort of basically the car industry post the financial crisis. And, you know, a lot of people were like, oh, the government will make a hash of it, they'll never be able to do it well. And I remember re seeing some article a few years later in The Economist, which was like, oh, all of the things we predicted the government would mess up, they didn't actually did a really good job and they've restored, restored them to profitability and then they sold them back to the private sector. So, um, yeah, I don't know enough of the details about that case, but I, that's probably possibly closer to, you know, what we would be, be talking about. At least it's a sort of yeah. sophisticated manufacturing business with a lot of specialised knowledge. But maybe there are disanalogies in that, I, I don't know. And, and um, I, I don't know whether we have this in the paper, but of course we would not, we would not under the, the sort of uh, broad brush scenarios that we sketch, we would not, if the government would become the owner of the fossil fuel industry, the people who work there would not be fired. Of course not, you want to keep their knowledge. So, uh, because they have this, they have this expertise so, um, but they should become convinced or they should become motivated that they are no longer working for uh, a company that is in a, in essentially in profit maximizing, but that they are now working for 
a collectively owned company, which, and this is a bit paradoxic, parado par this is a bit paradoxically, is closing down itself. But you know, if we, that's why we started with this uh, stripes graph. It has, I mean, the, and that's really something on which there is more and more consensus. We have to keep as much of the oil and the coal and the gas in the ground. Yeah. Okay, we had two questions by the white column, so now we can have the second one. I wanted to hear a little bit more about those two assumptions that you made about um, suitable motivation and effective control. So, because it seemed to me that you were sneaking in something else as well, and that was because when you suddenly spoke about democratic control, and that being one of the good things about nationalization, it seemed to me as though that might only actually be the case if the population were also suitably motivated, right? Mm -hmm. So if they suddenly, if 60% are coal lovers, then that doesn't really, then democratic control would suddenly be a bad thing. And so I wanted to press you a bit more because it looks like there's like a legitimacy, democratic legitimacy value that you're appealing to there, but that actually isn't really in tune with maximizing uh, the goal that you're after. So I, I wanted to know, why shouldn't we just put it in the hands of whoever is suitably motivated and, has effect and can take effective control? Why the state? Why not you two? Like, why not just someone who it, we know are suitably motivated? Why isn't that just what we go for? Are you pleading for eco-dictatorship? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so I, um, I would say we're making an empirical sort of sub-assumption, so embedded in our effective, uh, in our suitable motivation assumption uh, is the assumption that in order to be suitably motivated, the population, one's, you know, there would have to be a civil society basis for that, which um, now for reasons we, we, we all know about, the greater civil society space and so on, we think that's more likely to occur in, in a democracy. But that's just a sort of empirical assumption that could be, could be wrong. And so I think for our argument to go through, it's not essential, right? It, it, in fact, if, it's, if it is feasible that, um, or maybe feasibility, feasible is the wrong word, if it is plausible or likely that um, author, authoritarian states and the obvious one there, or the obvious ones are sort of China, um, uh, you know, Russia, some of the Middle Eastern states, which are big fossil fuel producers. Um, uh, if they were to, um, you know, to the extent they're not already, um, you know, the company's not already in, pu in public hands, um, then, uh, yeah, I think the argument would apply then as well, right? So we're not saying you, you have to be a democracy for our argument to apply. I just think that that's more like, it's a sort of a, yeah, assume that um, it's more likely to, that motivation is more likely to emerge in a democracy. So I'm not, we're not trading on like some legitimacy sort of embedded value, it's just an empirical assumption, which could be wrong. Do you want to add anything into it? Yeah, no, I was just thinking um, what your question does put on the table is that if so in political philosophy, we often think that democracy is an important value, and we think that um, ecological sustainability, and in this case, climate, res basically rescuing the climate or uh, reducing the damage that uh, global warming re will do on those who inhabit the earth is a value. And you, you are also, of course, saying there may be, uh, yeah, a conflict between those two, a tragedy of uh, democracy in a global warming. That is really, I, you're right, that is really a problem that somebody else should write uh, another paper or another book about. What I do think actually, we haven't said this in the paper and also not in the presentation, but even if what we propose is, would be undesirable, so uh, let's assume it's undesirable what we propose, or even if it's unfeasible because people just, it provokes, oh no, nationalization, we don't want to go there. I think it we we it does we, we the paper might also have a kind of um, 
a way, uh, contribute to a wake-up call that we should no longer always only talk about solar panels on our roofs and uh, ne let's not use plastic bags and let's uh, cut out twice a week meat because that's not going to do it. And that was the, the point about the paradigm shift. We really have to think about, about the, 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 big the big structural changes that are needed. And of course, um, communities, I mean, I mean, local governments are often already doing that when they're thinking about how they can take all the a whole neighborhood off gas, in case like I come from the Netherlands, where the houses are on gas, and they have just plans, like five-year plans, and they're going to take area by area off gas, and they, because you can't do it with one house, you have to do it uh, in, a, in a structural way. So it's actually interesting that some uh, practitioners and policymakers are uh, on that level already doing structural things, but of course there's no resistance because there will be compensation, there will be info meetings, there will be uh, subsidies for households who can't afford it, and there will be a lot of resistance with whatever you want to do with the fossil fuel industry. So I think if they see, they being whoever talks with the fossil fuel industry and the industry itself, that there are uh, voices out there who, who then argue, you know what, let's, if we want to solve this problem properly, let's nationalize it. Perhaps uh, that also just kind of generates or contributes to generate to certain uh, debate that gets the urgency across. Because that is really the tragedy now, that the urgent, urgency doesn't come across. Okay, sorry, can I just quickly add one thing? So one, one caveat to my response to David was, um, of course, we did, we did have these secondary evaluation criteria, these democratic arguments, and of course, they wouldn't apply if to non-democracies, but they're sort of peripheral to our, to our case. Um, and the other thing just to say is, as I sort of alluded to, yeah, a lot of the kind of key author authoritarian countries already have state-owned fossil fuel industries, and of course, those industries were nationalised in a very different context, you know, by rulers who wanted to sort of maintain power and so get the oil rents in order to maintain power. So that, that's a, a whole different kettle of fish. And there are people um, you know, who work, like the National Resource Governance Institute that's doing fantastic work, looking at the, all of the challenges of climate mitigation in already state-owned com com companies, um, um, which you know, I think is sort of like what the gentleman in the front row was saying earlier, is you know, these very different national contexts in, um, in, in these kinds of, uh, of countries. So, so what we really have to say doesn't really speak to that. It's much more like Ingrid said about sort of potentially open, relatively open, rich democratic societies that, that do have fossil fuels of which there's sort of a handful where this might, could, could gain traction and, and could work. Okay, let's uh, move on. The next question is second row, front. Yep, um, Mike coming. Uh, I, I don't think you mentioned um, carbon capture and storage in your, in your talk. But I wondered if you could, could you turn your nationalised oil company into a carbon capture and storage company? Because a lot of the infrastructure and skills in the oil industry can be repurposed for CCS. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll take a first go at that, Ingrid, because yeah. it's, yeah. So, so yeah, so one of the, um, I think it was point 0.5 um, on my list was about um, uh, research development and demonstration and leveraging existing assets. And I mentioned offshore wind and I sort of deliberately avoided um, CCS because it's a controversial topic among environmentalists. I think there's a, um, a genuine question about whether CCS will play some marginal role, um, uh, and I think it's possible that it might, that it might need to, probably less so for, for coal and, and electricity production, but potentially um, in, for steel, steel and cement production, that we might need CCS. And to the extent that we do need CCS, then we need companies to, um, you know, oil and gas companies to be leveraging their assets to do that genuinely. And I think part of the problem um, with the CCS debate, such as it's been to date, Perhaps a bit less so in Europe, where it's a bit more of a technocratic debate, but certainly in Australia, where I'm from, and in the, in the US, CCS has been basically, the, the CCS industry is very small, but the CCS public relations industry is very large. And so fossil fuel companies basically invest in a few little pilot projects that uh, a tiny fraction of their profits, 
but then they can, in all of their industry ma PR materials, they can say, oh yeah, look, we're capturing emissions and we're doing, this is the future, which is sort of becomes a fig leaf to just continue expanding production. So it's not a serious attempt to do it. And I think one benefit, I think it's sort of an open question, the extent to which CCS will and will need to play a role in a decarbonised future. Um, but what I think we, we would say is that under suitably motivated government control, there would at least be a, a genuine sort of investigation of that extent. It, you wouldn't have this problem of just a little bit of CCS for public relations purposes. They could sort of genuinely see, okay, what, what's a reasonable amount of resources to invest in this? What are the sort of wider public benefits if we do so? Where can we really, you know, maximise um, uh, the sort of the usage of CCS in some of these hard to abate sectors? So, yeah, and I, and, you know, I'm not an expert in, in CCS, but I'm sort of aware of some of these, these, these risks of going too far in that direction. But I think we could at least have a sort of a genuine um, sort of trial or, you know, leverage the existing assets to, to, to explore what could be done on CCS. Good. Next question is just across the middle of the aisle. Uh, yes, you, yeah. Thank you. Um, building on, on Kai's point about states often being worse at, and pro at producing goods, certain goods than, uh, than the private sector, that's actually, I think, in some cases, a reason for nationalizing uh, fossil fuels, fossil fuel industry. <laughs> so in some countries, that's what you want. You want, you want, the, you want the companies to produce as, as little as possible, <laughs> nationalizing them might work. Yeah, but I understood Kai's point also more that in, pr in producing the good, whatever that good is in this case, then oil or coal or whatever, the question is how much do you pollute in that process? So, of course, th that's how I understood your point. That yeah, you said just clean, Kai. Did you, yeah, is that what you meant? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah. avoiding spills. But, and, yeah. but, you know, there's, of course, uh, of course, that's not nationalization, but I really think that uh, this idea that the... It, which is, I'll say, first say what the idea, the idea that the private sector always does things more efficiently than the public sector, that is just empirically not true. I didn't say that. No, 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 but I, no, 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 but I just mean, but in, I, I would say, but perhaps I'm, I'm too worried about this, that this is kind of a, a uh, well, if I can so call it like that, an ideological feature of, uh, European and North American societies, that we believe this. And I just think we need to really uh, pull it, uh, tear it into separate sectors and just ask for each of the sector, what is the best way to deliver what is needed? Yeah, anyway, it was, well, it was not directly on your point, but it was good to uh, come up with this counter argument. Okay, the next question is at the penultimate row towards the back. That's it, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I had a couple of points on the sort of the first road to serfdom um, point that you had. So, um, I'm sorry if I misrepresent uh, your arguments. Um, you said that uh, governments do often own things, and, and so that's sort of okay, I guess. Um, it's one thing for governments to own things, but I wonder if it's problematic for governments to like proactively take ownership of assets. And I wondered whether you'd found um, kind of precedents for that happening, happening in sort of democratic countries um, at the sort of scale that perhaps we'd be needing here. Um, mm -hmm. And then the second point was, um, you know, would, where would government stop? You know, would it stop at sort of just nationalizing the fossil fuel industries? And, and I think you were sort of saying perhaps that it, it would because that would be sufficient. But I wonder, you could perhaps have an argument that um, governments would maybe nationalize the farming sector or the fishery sector as other um, uh, fossil fuel generating sectors and so you could perhaps envisage a situation where the government would uh, have a bit of a land grab, um, stop farming, um, maybe reforest all the farmland um, and I wondered whether perhaps yeah. you'd uh, consider that as well. Maybe. Thank you. Yeah, so, so you know, in, uh, philosophically, uh, the underlying question on whether you can do this as a government is what is your theory of property? So depending on whether you, you so if you have a sort of an instrumental theory of property whereby property is there to serve certain further, certain in, in, uh, ultimate values, such as well-being uh, and other values, um, then um, 
You can, of course, not violate property rights if you have no good reason. But if there is a good reason, such as uh, avoiding severe uh, climate uh, damage, then that may be a reason to violate property rights. Well, violate then has yes, to uh, transfer property rights and give proper compensation. So um, that basically, to your second question, um, uh, in, in the Netherlands, we have just this enormously big uh, bio industry and a lot of uh, uh, meat production is for exports. And that creates a big problem with uh, certain types of greenhouse gases. And uh, the problem has become so uh, big in terms of the not meeting the targets, the European targets, that the, our government, which was a car-loving government with car-loving voters, decided to lower the speed on the highways to 100 kilometers an hour because that would at least uh, create a bit of a, uh, lower a bit some of the other emissions uh, because there was at some point no new houses could be built. So that was a problem that, that, you know, some of these greenhouse gases, they could come from different industries. So if a lot of greenhouse gases come from the bio industry, it had the effect that uh, no new houses could be built and we have a housing crisis. So the only so short-term solution was to like immediately tell all the drivers they could not, no longer drive hard, uh, faster than 100 kilometers an hour, but that didn't solve the problem. So some uh, scholars from uh, one of the technical universities have indicated that if you were to buy up, hence, na hence yeah, nationalize and then close 10 big, f 10 farm farmers, you would actually be able to kind of get enough flexibility. And then uh, it is really the question like, um, how do you weigh the, uh, and, and I, I actually don't think they would be forced to. They would be made an offer they can't refuse, sort of that kind of, yeah, but, but you know, the thing is, of course, if you offer them a lot of money, I, I mean, there's so many people who have no house. So I think, yes, as a government, then offer them that money so that it really becomes a win-win for, for the government who, who has this, solved this problem, uh, and then they can start ha buying house, uh, building houses again for which the citizens need. So you, there is some, you need to think about this as a, as a comprehensive problem. And I do think there can be cases where um, you could um, nationalize, in this case then, yeah, nationalize or buy up property, but you always have to keep thinking because this could also be, for example, a family business, which has a lot of emotional value. And then I think it really becomes, so I, I think, for example, the fact of making good offers is a very different one than just really dictatorially seizing the property. So the details matter. To your question about whether there are other cases of taking ownership, I mean, I, the only example that comes to mind is that both the Dutch uh, the Dutch uh, have at some point in history taken over the coal mines because there were coal mines in both Belgium and the Netherlands that are now all closed. But I'm the, I don't think the goal at the time was to close them down. The, the goal was just to <laughs> keep them going because they were uh, insufficiently uh, profitable. That, that is what I believe to be the case. But I know for sure that there were private uh, privately owned coal mines uh, that at some point went into government's hand. Very quick couple of additions. So yeah, a bunch of examples post-financial crisis, including the, the car industry one I alluded to. Obviously a lot of banks <laughs> were taken into public ownership, but often it's a very reactive sort of socialization of losses. And I suppose this, you know, I would like to see government also doing more proactive um, uh, sort of ownership in areas that are also profitable that the public can share in the benefits. Though in this particular case, it would be more of a proactive um, sort of socialization of some losses, right? Um, there's also obviously the case of sovereign wealth funds, which are more sort of passive, to some extent active, but kind of shareholdings, um, including the Norwegian one being the, the, the big example. Um, and it's sort of something we explored in an earlier paper is sort of the idea of, as an intermediate strategy, governments taking a minority stake. So they wouldn't have all of, they wouldn't be able to do all the things we wanted, but they could potentially influence strategy and policy and, and, and so on. So that could be something worth exploring. Um, and then on the other sectors, I mean, I think you sort of answered this with the first question that, yeah, some of our arguments could apply to other sectors. But one thing I think it's important to keep in mind, even for other greenhouse gas emitting sectors, is, you know, 
certainly for sort of smaller and less politically powerful sectors, you could achieve a lot of the benefits through regulation and pricing. And I think, as, as we've emphasized, one of the key issues with the fossil fuel industry is their sort of strategic role in the wider political economy. Um, and so I'd be sort of looking at that, looking at their capacity to kind of influence the public and I influence policy and so on. Of course, that is itself a barrier to acquiring the companies, but nonetheless, these are kind of the, the, the kind of systemic considerations that I think are particularly important. I feel we're just getting warmed up. <laughs> Unfortunately, we've reached the end of our allotted time. So apologies to those of you who haven't been able to ask your questions. The conversation obviously continues, but we're going to have to end on this note. Uh, on behalf of the Royal Institute of Philosophy, I'd like to thank Foils for hosting this event. I'd like to thank all of you for coming and participating in it. I hope you've got something out of it. And most of all, I'd like to ask you all to thank Ingrid and Fergus for giving us such an excellent presentation this evening. So a round of applause. For that. Thank you.